Of the debate, the chair recognizes the member from Beaches East York. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is my enormous honour to rise to give my inaugural address to the Legislature, and I'd like to welcome my father, Marcus Burns, and my partner, David McGowan, to be here. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, before I begin, I would like to acknowledge that the land on which we gather today is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, the Anishinaabe and the Mississaugas of the New Credit. I also want to take a moment to pay tribute to Reese Fallon, whose life was taken on the Danforth on Sunday night. Reese was one of my constituents, and yesterday I was able to spend some time with some of those who loved her. They describe her as a brilliant and passionate young woman with a keen interest in helping others. Reese was an excellent student at Malvern Collegiate and had just been accepted into the nursing program at McMaster. She was looking forward to her studies and excited about pursuing her dream of becoming a nurse. I know that the prayers of everyone in this chamber today are with Reese's family and loved ones as they deal with this unimaginable loss. I want to thank again the people people of Beaches East York for their confidence and trust in me. It is a profound privilege to represent them here at Queen's Park. This government says over and over and over again that it governs for the people. And I want to take my time with you today to think through what it means to truly govern for the people. It's important to govern for the people, of course. That is presumably why we are all here. But there is an enormous difference between governing for all the people and governing for just some of the people. And in that gap lies everything, for the arc of the universe bends towards justice eventually. And in that gap lies the difference between a government that will be remembered for its generosity of spirit and the grandeur of its vision and a government that will eventually be viewed with contempt for its misguided and self-serving narrowness. Like many other Ontarians, I was distressed on the first day of this parliament to hear that the throne speech la that laid out this government's intentions and its framework for governing contained not so much as a land acknowledgement, never mind a commitment to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action or to reconciliation. Reconciliation has, in fact, disappeared from the government's vocabulary. Very early in its mandate, and in fact on the eve of the writing sessions that would have built curriculum to teach respectful and accurate history of Indigenous peoples in this province, as per the TRC's calls to action, this government cancelled the contracts to Indigenous elders who were to participate in that exercise and cancelled the exercise itself. Let us be clear here, that cancellation amounts to a loud announcement that the government does not believe that teaching accurate Indigenous history is of value to Ontario's students. Nowhere in the throne speech is there a commitment to right historical wrongs or to fix the destruction wrought by residential schools and the attitudes that created them. Meanwhile, the government has sown confusion about carding. The Premier and Minister for Correctional Services have said they don't intend to bring carding back, but that they are in favour of street checks and of giving police all the tools. They don't seem to want to be clear, so I will be. In the first place, carding and street checks are two different terms for the identical, harmful, profoundly racist practice. The government is playing semantic games. Carding has been discredited across North America as an effective tool for lowering crime, but it has been demonstrated to result in increased police harassment, violence, and the over-incarceration of black, brown, and indigenous people. Let me say this again. There is zero evidence that carding saves lives, but there are mountains of evidence that it results in the further marginalization and over-incarceration of black, indigenous, 
and Muslim people. Second, and equally importantly, you can't bring back something that has never stopped. The previous government placed regulations upon carding but did not end it, and the communities that experience it know full well that it has never ceased. As with any other inherently racist practice, no amount of carding is acceptable in any society that is truly governed for all its people. Carding needs to be completely ended and its data, which continue to harm those who have been its victims, destroyed. What this government has done unequivocally is to halt the Special Investigations Unit Act, which would have provided a desperately needed level of oversight and transparency to the SIU. Police work to protect all communities and all the people, and because of that, I know that they welcome an open, transparent oversight process that would contribute to increased trust and which would, in fact, make their work more effective. Because the goal is to keep us all safe, I know officers from every community welcome an end to the harmful racist practice of carding that does the opposite. In fact, by increasing street checks and treating the police as though they have special powers to behave without oversight, the government sets them up in an unnecessarily adversarial position to racialized communities. In other ways as well, the government has played semantic games with the well-being of Ontarians. By repealing the revised 2015 sex ed curriculum, the one that teaches consent and respect for gender diversity and LGBT 2 spirited youth. The government claims it is using the 2014 curriculum, which is, in fact, the 1998 curriculum, because that is when it was written. A curriculum that did not teach consent and that was written before same-sex marriage was legal in Canada. I would like to know why the Me Too movement has had no effect on this government that claims to govern in the name of all the people. Like every woman in this chamber, my life would have been very different had the boys and men with whom I went to school and with whom I worked learned the value of consent at school. We've already lived the experiment of what happens when consent isn't properly taught. I am sure we all wish the boys and men in our lives had been clearer on that concept, had taken it to heart, and had acted upon it. The government has been unequivocal in its refusal to contribute financially to the resettlement of asylum seekers who are desperate to make new lives in Ontario, despite mountains of evidence that whatever money government spends in helping asylum seekers to settle, they more than repay when they get on their feet and their children become your doctors, your lawyers your rocket scientists, your nurses, your social workers, the artists that inspire us, and the entrepreneurs who create our jobs. So let us be clear about this as well. Because this government won't end carding, black and brown and indigenous and Muslim people will be at risk at risk of harassment, of violence, of limited job options because they are known to police, and at risk of being unable to do something as simple as walk or drive in their own neighbourhoods with their families. Because this government is repealing the 2015 sex ed curriculum that allows queer youth to feel safe and affirmed in their understanding of themselves, they will be at risk. Because the research has been done, Mr. Speaker, and we know that youth are at greater risk of bullying in these circumstances, and we know that they are at greater risk of self-harm when they experience this kind of hateful bullying. We know that more boys will grow into men who have not been taught the fundamental importance of consent, and more girls and women, and especially Indigenous girls and women, will have to deal with the consequences. Because of delays in teaching a TRC-informed curriculum, ignorance and prejudice will continue to persist in that vacuum. And this government will demonstrate to Indigenous people by ignoring the TRC and calls to action that, that, that where they are concerned, reconciliation is nothing more than a fancy word. 
Because of this government's short-sightedness, asylum seekers who are trying to make Ontario their new home will be met with fewer supports and more roadblocks. The people of Ontario are Indigenous, Black, Brown and Muslim. And let me tell you, Mr. Speaker, why these issues matter so very much to me. I was born in South Africa of a mixed background. My parents left because of apartheid when I was a few months shy of my fifth birthday. We moved to Montreal, and as light as my skin is, it was significantly darker than that of my peers, and I encountered constant anti-black racism as well as anti-Semitism while I was growing up. Those experiences made me think a great deal about the ways in which racism is constructed, especially institutional and structural racism. Every year at school, teachers were suspicious of my ability to perform well. I had to prove myself in ways that my peers did not. I was accused of theft at the local shopping mall. I was told over and over again in so many words and indirectly that I did not belong that I would be tolerated only so long as I knew my place. I was meant to understand that I was inferior to my white Christian classmates, that I would always matter less. You may not be surprised to hear that this constant barrage of violent messages had a significant impact on my self-esteem. I became shy, withdrawn, unsure of how to make a place for myself in the world. And perhaps not surprisingly then, I went on to do a PhD in international politics and to do work on questions of belonging. Specifically, I was interested in how we go about creating societies that are diverse, but also socially just. How do we disrupt power structures and recreate them in ways that really work for everyone? What does meaningful inclusion mean? How do we create societies that are the political opposite of the one into which I was born. My research over the years has included thousands of interviews with racialized Canadians. I learned many things, but one is particularly relevant here. As much as we do many things relatively well in this country, the darker the color of your skin and the more you perform faith or back home culture or indigeneity on your person, the more likely you are to experience institutional, structural racism. Racism is not just people using a list of problematic words. It is a series of barriers that make it harder for some of us to get through school, feel good about ourselves, get and keep good jobs, and rise in organizations. The classifications that people in power make can result in other groups of people being targeted as suspicious or inherently problematic. And that, in turn, results in their overrepresentation in the criminal justice system and their underrepresentation in law firms or places like this legislature. Systemic racism is not a fairy tale that overeducated elites make up for their own amusement. It underlies the way most of our societies are organized. It is morally repugnant and deeply wrong. It is also expensive and self-defeating. It costs way more money to jail disproportionate numbers of black and indigenous men for one year than it does to fix the curriculum that dehumanizes them or to eliminate the barriers that lie in the way of their ability to reach their full potential. Systemic racism and barriers thwart individual lives, but also our institutions. They make no sense to any society that truly cares about the welfare of all its community, all of its people. And here's the thing. We in Canada face a conundrum. It is important to our international reputation and our national sense of self to be seen to be good at managing diversity. We like to say things like, diversity is our strength, and boast about our multiculturalism. And it's true that we do manage our diversity better than lots of other countries. 
My research shows, for instance, that people feel a freedom in Canada to be themselves and to find ways to blend their complex identities that makes them feel more Canadian, not less so. It shows that our political culture has nurtured respect for difference, which ultimately has helped us to make a deeply rich, peaceful country. But that also means that it's hard for us to look in the mirror and be honest about the crucial things we're, we're getting very, very wrong. And the thing is, we don't get to say we're good at it when we're not. When we refuse to understand that settlers committed genocide for centuries in this country, when we don't see or won't see or take responsibility for the mess we created, the mental health disaster in Indigenous communities, and the violence of the poverty that is the legacy of federal and provincial policies, when we refuse to do the healing and take on the hard work, when we refuse to understand the ways in which Indigenous and Black people experience state systems, including education, child welfare, and criminal justice, including poverty, inadequate social services, and transportation. When we tell everyone to get over themselves and just be Ontarians, as this government's throne speech did, but we won't admit that Ontario's systems work for some, but not all of us. Which brings me to why it matters how we define the people. Residential schools are the direct result of colonialism that held that Indigenous people did not matter and that their lives were worth less. We continue to live with its residue. Carding, too. The idea that certain people need to be watched and surveilled and kept track of is the direct result of these long colonial histories perpetuated by Britain and France and Belgium and Holland and other European settler nations. The idea that the people who mattered were some of, but not all of, the actual living human beings in any geographical space. That too, of course, was South Africa's fatal flaw, the one from which my parents fled, the reason I live in Canada today. So when I hear a throne speech and its government refer to the people, while the actions they promote consistently, determinedly, and harmfully serve some of us more than others, I will stand up and speak against it with every ounce of breath in my body. Because the only way Ontario works for all of us is if we work to make it so. Through a determination to seriously engage with the TRC's calls to action, and in that way, the achievement of reconciliation. Through the complete elimination of carding and other systemic racist practices, including the destruction of the data thus far collected via street checks. Through systemic changes to our criminal justice, health, transportation, education, and child services. Through work to ensure that every Ontarian has access to safe, dignified housing and clean drinking water and that all of us, regardless of sexual orientation, gender identity, ethnicity, race, faith, or ability, are the people to whom our throne speeches refer. My very dear friend, Michael Redhead Champagne, who visited from the north end of Winnipeg over the weekend, gifted me with an Ininu, or Swampy Cree, word on Saturday. Mino bimata se win. It means the good life. The good life is what we all seek in Ontario and across this country. The good life is what we ought to govern to create. And we cannot live the good life until we work to create its conditions for each and every one of us. Mino bimata se win can only be achieved if we work to make it happen for all the people, not just some of the people. Ontario doesn't actually work for any of us if it doesn't work 
for all of us. Mino bimata se win is only achievable when all of us can partake in it. And I think it behooves this government to remember that while a first-past-the-post system delivered it an electoral victory, a majority of the people who voted did not vote for these regressive shifts in policy or for change to legislation that will result in the deaths of family and community members. So far, this government has focused on destroying things. The cap-and-trade system that would have moved us forward on climate change, a consent-based sex ed curriculum, a TRC-informed curriculum with regard to the history and lived experiences of Indigenous peoples in Canada, contracts with Indigenous elders and with businesses. And make no mistake, that destruction will be expensive in terms of impact on people's lives, but also in dollars. So far, it is not the people, but the lawyers who will benefit from its actions and the taxpayers who will pay for them. We could be spending those tax dollars on creating Mino Bimatisewin. <coughs> this government may play semantic games, but it will be remembered for doing so. Governments should indeed be for the people. The objective is absolutely admirable, but thus far, this government has demonstrated a very narrow idea of who those people are. So I ask the government, demonstrate that you will work to create Mino Bimatise Win for all the people. And if you cannot, understand that the people will find a government who can. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Miigwech. Thank you.